Stand by. Is this thing on? Yes, Dan. Oh, hello. You're listening to Old News with Dan and Carrie. This just in. Breaking news to report. We are live. Old newscasters reunite. Uh, can we just say former? Sure. Former newscasters reunite behind the mic after more than 20 years. Old news is good news. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Old News with Dan and Carrie. I am Carrie, and that's Dan. And today we continue our conversation with Bob Miller. It's really been fascinating so far, hasn't it, Carrie? We've heard it about has. kind of his philosophy in dealing with business, and he's he's really taken a lot of chances over the years, a lot of risks, and it's turned out pretty well because of those philosophies and his his kind of face to face idea. Um, but there's so much more to learn about Bob. What else are we going to hear about? We're going to hear about him living in Ireland and why that became a dream of his, plus some of his other bucket list items. So stay tuned. Were you one of the people who, when we when we were at 27, we did these things called Our Towns, mm. uh, Our Towns, yeah. where we'd go out and do a yeah. whole live in a whole community. Yeah. Was that you who kind of helped? That, that was coming that back. That? That's, I was running the place when that, that wasn't okay. in my smash days. That okay. was the return. But what were you one of the people who kind of made that happen? Um, yeah, yeah, that was again wearing the marketing hat, mm-hmm. you know, to go to Sun Prairie or Spring Green or Baraboo and feature them. You know, they owned KOW for the week and got right. to show mm-hmm. off their community. Mm-hmm. And we had that, you know, because we had built those incredible new sets with the glass window. Yeah. And, and the bat window, as I heard. And the staged and the staged <laughs> scenes in the back sometimes. Here, take this tape. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do something. Yeah, do something. Or do a but, cartwheel um, yeah, for we, the Christmas show. We had that show. portable. Yeah, we had that portable news set that looked just like the real news set that we'd yeah. cart all around. And, you know, after a time, it kind of, as everything does, wore up. But for yeah. a while, it was... Great. It was pretty cutting edge. Yeah, back those then, were nice. It seemed like. Yeah, so, it was a great way to show off the community. And you kind of took that then the next step and you went to Discover Media Works for a little while too. Who does that? You know, they do the whole Discover Wisconsin yeah. programming and all yeah. of that. So, was so that... what happened there was um, a group of us bought KOW and all yep. the ABC, you know, the, the, the sister stations and, um, under Shockley Communications moniker. SCC. And I was one of the investors in that and got to run KOW. It was one of the perks of being an investor because it yeah. was truly my dream job, hmm. which sidebar takes me back to that 22 year old reporter in the newsroom having a t- tantrum yeah. about any monkey can run the TV station. Well, when that, you know, because it was pretty secret about us getting the stations and really secret about me because I was running Dynatech at the time. And um, I got at least three letters and or telephone calls from people who remembered that outburst in that newsroom. Really? And they said, so how do you like being part of the zoo now, ape man? <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely detest bananas. I hate, it's the only food I hate. And somebody knew that and the story. So, uh, so are you start eating bananas now, Bob, because since you're a monkey. And, oh, my gosh. Yeah, my so, friends keep me humble. Was it a little <laughs> more difficult than you had initially thought at age 22 to run a station? Uh, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> because there were good people that deserved that job as much, if not more, than I who had paid their dues like my best man in my wedding, Ken Simmons, who's coming to see me now. And um, so I was very fortunate. Not everyone was like, oh, geez, he was doing the computer stuff. He's done a lot, but, you know, this is a whole different ball game. Mm -hmm. But people gave me a shot and, um, you know, we turned it. It was fun. And as you know, you were part of that that magic that was Mm -hmm. created. You know, KOW worked hard to be noticed you know abc would give us a hit show every once in a while you know movie on sunday night but the news you know it was always we were trying to catch up with the other stations and stuff 
But during that time, and then with the advent of, you know, we were one of the first high definition television stations in the United States, certainly in the Midwest, we were the first, we were one of eight only, you hmm. know, for KOW, the place where I had to sneak film from Mark Kane, you know, is now <laughs> one of the first HD TV and then God bless. And I, we won't get in that. You guys say that for a weather person, but the Doppler wars, you were there for oh, the yeah. Doppler wars. Yeah. Yeah. Who was biggest, who had the biggest, <laughs> the best. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, no, I'm so proud the accomplishments and, and the two of you were, and that's where, you know, I don't mean to be cornball about this, but I was so thrilled when I saw old news pop up. I'm a big podcast listener, and um, it was music. You two have been a team, a very good team. Haven't aged a bit. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but thanks. Everybody you know, slides. <laughs> Yeah, you you guys are just so you were a big part of that in all sincerity. That was, uh, was you were those workhorses at four a.m. or three a.m. or two or twelve thirty if we had, didn't yeah. have a producer at the time. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> well, nice of you to say, and but also yeah. it it took leadership from people like yourself and mm -hmm. and you know Todd Pritchard and uh, Sandy and so many of the people who were managing not just news but the station like yourself to have that foresight to, to, I mean, we were the first morning show at channel 27, obviously channel three had one already. We were trying to maybe trying to catch up a little bit on that, but you guys made it happen. And my memory of being at the station at that time was a lot of money was spent on upgrading things at, at which was kind of unheard of in television at the time. It seems yeah. like, because we got a new, like you said, that glass, the glass studio and an extra studio for Fox and you know the morning show started and I think we started other newscasts too and it was pretty amazing that that was being invested into the TV station and as you mentioned before I mean we didn't see a ton of you because you were the station manager or the you know the general manager but mm -hmm. you would be seen you'd come through the you'd come through the newsroom and you did show mm -hmm. interest because probably like you said you liked journalism but mm -hmm. that meant a lot to people like us who are just like you said in the trenches trying to make stuff get stuff on the air so yeah. thank you for that yeah and you were definitely a, a management presence. yeah i i managed by in the morning carrying a coffee cup around and yeah. just dan, dan what's happening what's yep. meeting so what yep. happened and it's the same now and it was then it's you either get bigger and you eat or you get eaten. And Shockley, the goal of Shockley Communications was we wanted to get bigger. So as you're shopping for more TV stations, and we did pick up some stations along the way. We started yeah. some in Minnesota and the like. Mm. But um, they kept running into, Shockley kept running into this Quincy media out of Quincy, yep. Illinois, yep. same kind of deal, same size and everything. And it was like, geez, rather than compete with one another, you know, which one of us might. So we sold Quincy. Mm. And one of the requirements was I had to stay, you know, they, they, they weren't dumb about, you know, as they would say, we paid way too much for this station. We wanted to prove that you weren't making this up and you could deliver. So I was supposed to stay there for three years, continue mm. to be the GM to prove that everything was on the up and up, which it was. Um, and almost made it that three years, but uh, it was not as fun working for somebody again mm. as it was yep. being my own mm -hmm. boss. Mm -hmm. And right. they had a very different way. So as as the media business goes... There weren't enough, there wasn't enough room in town for two sheriffs. So yeah. they had bigger pockets than me. So I stepped away and thought mm. I was going to retire. But, you know, I did not want to work till I died. Oh. And um, I was wrong. I was too young. I was only 58 or so. No, mm. I forget what I was. But Oh, that is young. very young. And That's very young. Bored. <laughs> yeah, very, very young. And um, <laughs> to retire. <laughs> and so we had done Discover Wisconsin on KOW. And I became mm -hmm. friends with Mark uh, Rose. And it was a family business. Mark and his brother was the talent. Mark was the salesman. And their sister was the audio and the computer person. And when their dad died, then they decided they didn't want to battle one another over who's who. 
So the two siblings sold it all to Mark and Mark was good at selling, but didn't want to be the management guy. So he asked if I'd come on board and they were in Milwaukee at the time. So yeah. he said, I'll do it for a month as hmm. a consultant. And it ended up, I don't know how many years, three or four years. <laughs> and um, I couldn't do the drive to Milwaukee, got to oh. me. So Mark said, fine, move it to Madison. And um, you know, I was able to get to, um, quite a few of the employees to come to Madison. And we built oh. a brand new facility and they still seem to be humming along and still doing it. It's great. Still doing yeah, it. Yeah. And how did you, how did you then end up over at the Overture Center as the director of major gifts because yeah, that seems kind of like a, a um, pivot yeah it, it was it's this bucket list you know i do have a i truly have had a bucket list since i was a kid of dreams i did and one of my career dreams was i never worked downtown and i love madison's downtown mm -hmm. i really loved it yeah. you know we were always my career was always on the far west side in yuppie land Mm -hmm. And I wanted to work down there. And so they were going through some trials and tribulations. If you remember, Paul Soglin was for the umpteenth yep. time the mayor of Madison and was yeah. fighting overture and kind of wanted. And it was getting, you know, and it's still to this day the greatest personal gift that Jerry Frouchy gave mm -hmm. in, in the performing arts in the United States after all these years. It's still That's the largest beautiful. sum of money. Hmm. 240 million so they approached me to come down there and um so i got to tick that off and enjoyed it you know i was um, i went to everything at overture we always had tickets oh, yeah. hopefully you benefited at the tv station we always had season tickets for things yeah I, and um, went a so few times. i like doing that and then what happened to end the career was um Going back, it's a small world, but mm. to Terry Kelly, um, I was, meanwhile, the mayor of Monona, and the um, Nature Center is in Monona. The city owns um, the Aldo Leopold Nature Center. Terry Kelly was chairman of the board from its beginnings, and they lost their longtime CEO, Cap Khan. Yeah. And so Terry tapped me on for like the third time in my career. Bob, you know. We always had an interesting relationship. I need you, Bob. But, uh, yeah. 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 So, and it's, you know, I was just, and it wasn't a conflict of interest. I took it as being, this is great. You know, the city knows what's going on at the Nature Center. The Nature Center can communicate directly to the city by being there. So I was there. But of all the jobs I had, perhaps the most difficult was my last one. Nonprofit really? work at Madison oh. is hard. Hmm. And Overture was that to a degree, but that was a very large, sophisticated operation. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, the, the joke that there's 600 nonprofits in Dane County is not a joke. I mean, hmm. yeah, probably more than that now. Not. Yeah. What made you step into being mayor? What made you want to get into politics and serve in that way? So the deal was with that. You know, I never traveled. I'd never been on an airplane until I graduated from college. And so now I'm working in Green Bay and start traveling with the Packers. And those were my first airplane rides ever mm. to be with the Packers, you know. And, so, mm -hmm. and I'm like, oh, this is cool. And then <laughs> I get to Dynatech you know, and Color Graphics and I'm flying around the United States with Color Graphics. Then I become president of New Star and most of our customers were international. So now I'm 26, 30 weeks a year overseas somewhere so from never going anywhere to being in, i've been in just about every country that exists hmm. in the world not so much south america but um the rest of the world i've been just about everywhere and so i was raised by special parents as many of us have had and one thing i learned about them is the really pay it forward my parents had no money my mother was a minister and a homemaker my father was a builder, but they just gave of their time and self and, and donated. So I always wanted to do that, but I couldn't because I couldn't. If you're going to have a meeting, I couldn't promise I'd be there. I might be in Yugoslavia that day or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so I couldn't do things like that. And then when I got the TV station deal, then it was one important to be community involved mm -hmm. and two i could now try to make up for all those years of not 
giving back to the to society and to the people. Mm. So I probably went overboard, you know, when I was looking at, you know, I think 21 organizations I've chaired in mm. both in Ireland and back in the States. And um, it's just, I don't say no well, but asked to help. And if I can help, I try to do the best I can. And with politics, I always wish that was one, my bucket list. It wasn't on my bucket list because I didn't know how you even did that. Yeah. But if I could do college all over again, I would have got my butt in that capital and got an internship and mm. learned the ropes. I would have loved nothing more than, mm. I don't know where it could have gone, but to have done more. So the one thing I could do was in Monona. And it actually was a case got to be delicate how to say this one, but um, my predecessor was stepping down to run for state legislature. Mm. And as he had been, his predecessor kind of handpicked him. This one, this mayor kind of said, Bob, we can't let this guy who wants that job his whole life be the mayor. You got to do it. We can't mm. let him do it. And I kind of agreed. So it was kind of one, not so much that I wanted to be mayor. I just didn't want the other guy to be the mayor. Oh. And um, it turned out to be not at all that case. Mm -hmm. Once I became mayor, I absolutely loved it. And uh, again, I think, you know, Monona is only three and a half square miles. That's all it is and all it could ever be. Oh. Yeah. It's not all the land at Sun Prairie and the forest and Fitchburg has. Mm -hmm. So the only way for Monona to survive is to redevelop and go mm -hmm. vertical. So that was a big focus. And we did some amazing developments that I'm still to this very minute so proud of there. Mm -hmm. and it was a great job. And still, more people call me Mayor Bob than they call me Bob. <laughs> right. there. More, more than and, call uh, you bad, Bob. And, yeah, and bad Bob, just shockly. <laughs> and there well, it was, um, we didn't have an office. The mayor, I gave up the office because they needed space. Uh -huh. So my office was actually the farmer's market on Ooh. Sundays mornings. So I would set up an office truly and advertise. And when we started our WVMO radio station there, I would do an hour radio show from the mayor's office at the farmer's market. Well, you said, so bad Bob, Mayor Bob, and I saw an article that you sent me where they called you TV Bob, and that was an article in Ireland. Oh. So is that just because, did they call you TV Bob because they knew you worked in TV or what? No, that was specifically. So what happened with it, it is weird. I've had just, life is magical. <laughs> so I'm here in Ireland. As a, they call people who weren't born and raised in Ireland, blow-ins. So I am a true blow-in. I have no Irish blood, mm. no ties at all, but they have really been nice to me. So when COVID hit, there was a TV celebrity. His name was Hector Mohawkigan, an Irish name. And um, Hector wa is like uh, Irish Charles Corral when he used to go on the road. Oh, yeah. Or yeah. The guy who does it now or um, MSNBC, yeah. you know, the mm -hmm. people who travel and, and yep. do these things. And it was all international. Hector would only go around. And he does it for the Irish language, the Gaelic channel. Mm. And he's a big celebrity. I'd never heard of him, didn't know who he was. COVID hits. He can't go and do his story. That's how he makes his living. Mm. You know, he's kind of like uh, the travel guy. Uh, mm -hmm. Does the famous uh, Steve Irwin. No, not oh, yeah. but whatever that guy who travels all the time. So Hector doing this, and apparently he put out an announcement that he wanted to do a story because Ireland's changing. It's not all red hair, mm. young lasses, and beer drinking. And, in the pubs it's mm -hmm. ethnically blending there is a lot of dark skin in ireland now and it's great stuff and hector had this belief that the irish don't appreciate their own country and that there's mm -hmm. people who are moving to ireland like myself who are desperate it's very difficult for me to live in ireland to get permission every year it's oh. just expensive and impossible almost, but I pulled mm. it off eight years. Mm. And um, so Hector announced that he wanted to do a series because he couldn't travel on Ireland 
and find out who is New Ireland, who are the people. So I guess he put a casting call out and someone anonymously nominated me. So I get a call from a producer one day at Christmas and I couldn't go anywhere because COVID. And they said, we were told that you're an interesting guy who moved to mm -hmm. Ireland and stuff. And would you audition to be on this thing? And I'm like, what? You know, so it was a one minute video in front of the Christmas tree introducing myself. And the next thing, you know, they, they had hundreds and hundreds and they never knew who nominated me. And all of a sudden they said, we'd like you to be on. So that yeah. news story, TV Bob, was, they, it was, it's equivalent to BBC or CBS or, you know, sure. network doing this story. Mm -hmm. So the newspapers all picked up on it. Out here in the middle of nowhere is this American and Hector's going to do a story. And you know how news works. You give a minute 30, 90 seconds is a long story. And it was, I think they gave seven minutes. And Whoa. he drove out, and I took. Well, you're kind of a big deal. The sea. No, not at all. Not <laughs> at all. It was just. It was fun, and we had fun. He made me sing in Irish, and so that's what the TV Bob came up with, uh, just because. That's interesting. That's what I did for my career. And you said so. twenty years ago or so, you on a whim bought that place. What made yeah. you buy the place? Yeah. So the checklist was. Uh, you know, I was traveling with Dynatech everywhere and just got blown away because right now there's some people having a great time talking in Czech, in Czech Republic and in China. And there's good people and there's neat things. And we never think outside of our downtown Madison at times or village in Ireland, what goes on. And so I was just enamored by how cool the people I met in my career. And I wanted to live somewhere else. Mm. I love America. I'm a proud American. Some people, you know, I've been here eight years now. So before any of these candidates were running, so it's not, and I'm going to go back to America at mm -hmm. some point in time, a full time. And um, my wife had traveled for school and vacations a lot. Mm -hmm. um, so she was open to the idea. I said, would you be willing to live somewhere else for a year? And she said, sure. And so hmm. I kind of, I had an office in Dublin for Dynatech and I loved oh. going there. And so Ireland came. So my requirements on where to live were one, I grew up in the north woods of Wisconsin with no one around. So it had to be in the country. I don't mm -hmm. want a city. Mm -hmm. So in the country. Number two is I'm too old to learn Italian or French. You know, it's got, they have to speak English. And then Ireland, they kind of speak English. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, three, I'm an extrovert who doesn't shut up. Hmm. Pam is an introvert who never wants to say a word. Just leave her alone. Let her go hill walking and read her books. So we both had to be happy. Uh, four, I had grown up on water. We lived on Lake Monona in Madison. Mm -hmm. So I'd always been on water, but I'd never been on the sea. So if I could be by the sea, it would be a plus. And number five, I like beer. Yeah. So guess what country won? Yeah. <laughs> so Ireland won. All the you know checked off all the boxes. Well, and you Has said it... it's hard to stay there year after year. That was one of my questions. Was is are you a dual citizen, or are you you said you have to apply every year to stay there? Yeah, yeah. It's called the stamp zero. It's an expensive, laborious. I'm going through it right now. Mm. We moved in July, so my year in Ireland always starts in July. So I have to keep track of all my expenses. So when I buy that beer, I mm. have to keep a receipt for that. Oh. I have to do a spreadsheet to give the government. First, I have to give it to a special accountant mm. in Cork City that does an audit of everything. And the reason I think they've never really explained is they want to make sure I don't go on welfare. If I have a stroke, oh. the government doesn't have to support me. But mm -hmm. you can do that a lot simpler ways than what they're doing it here. Mm -hmm. I'm very frustrated about mm -hmm. it. But, um, you know, we have all these things. I have to give my marriage license. Um, Pam has her maiden name, so to, that we are truly married. Um, when the first year, I don't have to do this now, but I had to get a letter from the police chief of Monona that I wasn't escaping for some political corruption in Monona. Huh. You know, like, wow. 
<laughs> I wish. And you're the on the lamb. No, is yeah. <laughs> you know, if you get this visa, which we've gotten for eight years, it you're not allowed to work, you're not allowed to own a business, mm. but you have to have an income of 55,000 each. So Pam and I each have together have to have $110,000 income every year. So how do you uh, get income that if you don't work, to work or have a business? Well, through a pension. So oh. Pam worked for the state and has her state pension, but I had my own businesses and mm -hmm. ran yeah. businesses. So I live off investments mm -hmm. and they hate that here in Ireland because, you know, investments go up and mm. down yeah. and all over. Mm -hmm. But, uh, yeah, you have to, and they boot people out. I know two Americans that got the boot because that money was too hard to, you know, to get that a retired oh. school teacher. And their neighbors did petitions and did everything. Mm. So wow. um, I'll give you some breaking news. Yes. You know, the, the other thing is they say none of this counts for citizenship here, that a stamp zero visa is only that. It gives you one year. It's basically, there's only like 200 of them, I guess. So I'm fortunate to be able to get one or two of them, Pam and I. But uh, they say you cannot ever become a citizen. And I just, oh. I really got mad this year and said, why not? So I hired a lawyer who said, you know, there's nothing really. So I'm running it up the flagpole. We'll oh. see what happens. Oh. It'll be two years probably before I know, but I'm making huh. a play for it. Yeah. You talked about your first TV job, but I want to ask you what your first ever job was. And then do you still have something you want to do beyond? I mean, you're you're one of those guys who doesn't seem to really sit still, Bob. You've got a lot mm -hmm. going on, even in retirement. Is there something else you still want to do? But what was your first job, your first ever job? My first job, you know, I did the lawn thing when I was really young. You know, yeah. yeah. First toes. But my first real job was in 1969. Um, and like the flambeau, we lived out in the woods and there was a supper club near us and I got mm. a job washing dishes manually in the sink. Yeah. And I'll never forget that. Um, cause 69 is important because when Neil Armstrong walked on the moon, I was yeah. washing dishes mm. and they didn't have any mechanical dishwasher stuff. So I'm this little kid scrubbing these dishes and then some waitress would come with the beet juice from the freezer for the from the salad bar Ew. and dump it in my sink <laughs> it was the worst job <laughs> it was the worst because they had no water pressure and it would take like a half hour and everyone would be screaming where are the dishes and oh my god! i'd go home crying and so that was my <laughs> so my maybe first the first job. was the worst yeah first and the worst yeah. that's good and, and yeah. anything you still really what's still on your bucket list you're a bucket list guy do you still have something really big at the top of the bu bucket list um, not, not really because the, the age kind of puts its foot down. I'm healthy as a horse. I bike. I never biked in Wisconsin, you know, maybe once a year to go get a carton of milk at PDQ. Mm -hmm. And here I'm over 8,000 miles, 9,000 miles of cycling wow. here on mountains and, wow. uh, I bunt the, the peninsula, you can't see it, but this way is the southernmost tip of Ireland. And I bicycled from that southernmost tip to the northern 440 miles. Oh, my um, goodness. The Mizzen to Malin run. So Fantastic. I do a lot of that. So mm -hmm. I've accomplished that. I've climbed the highest mountain in Ireland. Mm -hmm. I've done a lot of things that I'm real proud of in life. And I'd still love to be involved with politics, mm -hmm. but you know, that there's one of those, we, they call them roundy birthdays uh -huh. in Ireland when you get to a decade birthday. Uh, and yeah. I'm coming up to a big roundy birthday a next roundy year. Birthday. And it's kind of, yeah. And it's kind of like, oh, I don't want to get, you know, I still feel <laughs> 35. I really do and want to be that. So, but I think my, you know, I still have the bucket list, but big dreams. I kind of done everything in my life that I've wanted to do. And we'll What's still on the to... bucket list? What's still in the yeah. on that list? Oh, in well, one that's coming. So um November, 
Um, so I, I mentioned, and I still do a lot of volunteer. I was the head of six organizations. In mm -hmm. May, I stepped on it all because I realized I'm not traveling like I thought I would be traveling, mm -hmm. living, you know, it's easier to travel to Europe when you live in Europe. And mm -hmm. I'm not doing that as much because I have so many obligations for organizations. Mm -hmm. So now, so my next bucket list is I always wanted to sail across the ocean oh. to go to the United States. So oh in November, gosh. we're sailing out of Spain and going 16 days wandering around the equator and end up in Orlando and then fly to Madison. We've got two grandchildren that mean that's my bucket list yeah. is yeah. to Yet every minute, you know, if you follow me and I welcome people, no politics, I don't care. I care, but mm -hmm. not on Facebook. Facebook mm -hmm. is my journal for mm -hmm. friends and family to wonder what the hell is Bob doing? <laughs> yeah. What nation is he so in I, now? I, I do yeah, Facebook. yeah I, I do Facebook to just kind of show people the world. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. That's awesome. And now we have to get back to your... Uh, your packer story yeah, your uh, i always story. ask like for a blooper right. yeah. like of yeah. the of the on-air people a blooper or just a crazy story and so you said you had yeah. a good one so for this the is the crazy story but important you know i'm sure both of you through your journalism career you know we've met a lot of amazing people and famous people i've met presidents and popes uh, and very fortunate for the celebrity parts of of the world but they're all normal people to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I never got into hero worship ever. You know, everyone's normal. I can be respectful to a president or the Pope, but there's still people. Mm -hmm. But there was one hero in my life, and that's being a little boy growing up in Wisconsin in the 60s, Bart Starr. Mm -hmm. I absolutely just melt get teary-eyed he was the greatest human being i ever met and i got to know him pretty well when i worked in green bay and traveled with packers so anyways i'm 22 years old i worked the night shift you know these weird hours we had and had weird days off and worked till 11 30 at night but then when they told me i was going to travel with the packers those flights would leave at 6 a.m in the morning so i would just be getting off work mm. and get back and when you're young you like to sleep yeah, now I'm just, I could go anytime because I don't sleep, but <laughs> as a 22 year old. So, my first airplane trip to go to Atlanta with the Packers, I overslept. <gasps> and I woke up and I had like 10 minutes for that plane to leave from Austin Straubel in Green Bay. And I'm just freaking, no shower, no toothpaste. <laughs> Fortunately, I had my DOP kit, read my duffel bag, just ran out the door, got in the car. It was about five mile drive, raced. Thank God no cops were there. Went screaming in and I look and the plane's still there, but there's no one there except Lee Remmel, who was the publicity director of the Packers is standing on the step looking at his watch. And he knew who was all supposed to be in that plane. And he's like, he didn't know who I was, but he knew I was the Channel 5. And he said, get on this and you better not be any more trouble. So I get in and I'm basically in tears. And I sit down next to Norm Beaver or whatever, the photographer of the Packers. So I'm sitting there just shivering and like, I knew I was, would have been fired. I would have lost everything. And who lo and behold gets on last on the ship, on the plane, Bart and Jerry Starr. Mm -hmm. He was coach of the Packers at the time. And he walks down the aisle and I am just going... And guess what seats he sits? He sits in across the aisle for her. So there is truly my idol. I stink, you know, I haven't paid. I haven't, you know, and I'm <laughs> haven't brushed your teeth. <laughs> yeah, I didn't brush my teeth. And there's Bart Star. And we're going there. And I just, you know, I didn't even look at him. I just cowered. And all of a sudden, they served dinner. And, you know, on a charter like that, it's good food. So it's steak dinners on China and everything. And I'm mm -hmm. watching. Because I haven't flown before. I don't know how this works. And so they bring the tray stand down, put the food down. And I'm still shaking. And don't screw up, Bob. Don't burp. Don't do whatever. And I'm cutting my steak. Honest to God. <laughs> or off it goes. Piece of steak with gravy on. Flies across the aisle. On Bart Starr's khaki pants. Oh, Greasy no. Greasy steak <laughs> all over. 
<laughs> and now I do start kind of crying. And Bart just kind of takes his napkin, dips it in his water glass, kind of rubs some of his slime off his leg. And he turns to me and he goes, doesn't it just fry you that trying to eat on an airplane is almost impossible. I just uh. hate it. Don't you? And he didn't scream at me. Mm -hmm. And so that is the story that will go to my grave with uh, me, my hero and what a class act he was. That's so nice. He probably remembered you after that too. What a way to be noticed, Bob. Oh, he did. <laughs> so I covered <laughs> after the games, they'd have the press conference and they had been killed by some team. And that was married. I guess I was up there for KOW shooting for somebody. And, um, I took Pam along because I had press passes and I said, you know, you can come into the press conference. And she's like, Oh, I don't know. And so we go in, there's 30 guys all sitting there and Bart's in, doesn't want to talk to them at all. And Pam's just standing at the back door, just trying to cower. Cause again, introverted mm -hmm. and, and Bart comes in and he goes, good afternoon, gentlemen and lady. <laughs> <laughs> so he acknowledged her there and she was just wanted to uh, die so he was a class act great and great lady story. great that yeah is... what a what a couple hey bob we could talk forever and yep. i wish we could and honestly i want yep. you to promise us one thing you will actually come back and talk to us again i'd love to talk to you again after your sailing trip across the ocean yes. or, or while you're I'll doing be there it. yep i'll be there well I'm too cheap. You know me when I was your boss. You know, I was, I was tight. No, so internet, I'm not buying the internet on the ship. And as they say in Ireland, instead of cheers, it's slancha. Slancha. <laughs> it's a date. All right. Well, thank awesome. you so much. It's been an absolute pleasure to catch up with you. And we appreciate your time. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in to Old News with Dan and Carrie. That's old news for now. Join us next time.